You've probably heard the term gold fever before, used to describe prospectors looking to head west and strike gold back in the 1800s. It implies that greed is a sickness, and the men in our story were not immune to its pull. Let's get into it. Hello, friends. Welcome to the Unshackled Audio Drama Podcast, where we share the gospel of Jesus Christ through the art form of audio drama. Yes, and that includes sound effects. I'm Timothy Gregory, bringing to you the story of a man whose decision to choose deception and greed over God's calling for him put him in more and more danger. But what would be his breaking point? We'll find out on today's Unshackled Audio Drama Podcast. Also, you want to stick around because later we're going to give the rest of you an opportunity to enter yet another sweepstakes drawing for a prize. Now, it's not a cash prize, but it is a prize, and I think it's a prize that you are really going to like if we draw your name. But first, let's get to it, folks. Part two of the classic story of William Call Wilcox. In here, Call. I'm not sure about this, Johnny. What do you mean? This spot's perfect. Uh, the overhang will keep us dry and protect us from the wind. Looks like a dry creek bed or something. Well, go back out if you want. But we don't got no blankets, so I ain't. Just saying, maybe we should keep looking. I'm too cold. Fine, it's just, well, something don't feel right. <laughs> Feels mighty good to me. <laughs> creek bed or no, I'll take this over. Shh. Quiet. Do you hear that? What? Almost sounds like a train. Flood! Johnny, that's a flood! Oh, that's a wall of water! Run! Run! Faster! Oh. Johnny! Help me! No! Help me! I can't swim! Some stories are just too full to be told in one chapter. Such a story is that of William Cullen Wilcox. We told part of his story last week, and we'll tell you more of it now. Carl Wilcox was born over a century and a half ago, but his problems were much like yours and mine today. You'll see why as we bring you this second chapter of the story as told to us by Carl's son, Mark. It comes to you right now on Unshackled. My dad never would have been out in that flash flood had he made a few different choices. But young Cole Wilcox and his partner in crime, Johnny, were wanted by the law in their part of Ohio. A drunken dare had led to a small theft. And without coming clean when given the opportunity, they landed themselves in jail. Instead of facing consequences, the boys escaped. And as fugitives in Chicago, found themselves on the street in midwinter, very close to penniless. Ah, this ain't no good, Cull. We gotta find a place to sleep with 20 cents to our names. I'm learning things about this town. You go to that flop house we saw over in Halstead Street and get us two beds. Price is 10 cents a night. I'll see you there. Where are you going? Me? <laughs> I'm going grocery shopping. <laughs> That's fine, but don't get caught. If I do, you be sure to sell my bed and get that dime back. Don't worry, I'll be smart about it. Their first few days in Chicago, the boys lived on carrots and crackers stolen from stores. After their first night in a flop house, they slept in railroad stations, an hour here and an hour there. Eventually, their search for jobs took them to the stockyards. Yuck! This mud is ankle deep! <laughs> That's not mud. Oh, gross! Oh, it's kind of good to be back around livestock again, though. If you like the critters, I don't. But maybe they need somebody to help handle them. Let's see if we can find someone to ask. How about that tall galoot standing over there by that pen of longhorns? Mister? Eh? Can I ask you something? Uh, you can ask, lad. I'll listen. You know of anyone who's hiring? Eh? Perhaps. Can you ride? Mister, we can ride anything. Ah, that's very interesting. 
But I was asking this lad here, so can you ride? Yes, sir, we're farm boys. Oh, there's a world of difference between a Belgian plow horse and a cow pony. I've broken a few horses to the saddle, mister, and so has my friend here. Well, then you might do. For what, sir? Punching cows in the great tall country they call Montana. Oh, we can do her, mister. Don't you worry about that. How much? I'm paying $20 a month and keep. We'll take it. Well, we sure will. Very well, lads. My name is Thomas McPhee, but some call me Scotty. Well? Oh, you mean our names? Aye. Well, uh... I'm Buckeye, Mr. McPhee, and they call me, uh, Hard. Ah, well, I'll accept those names until we're better acquainted. Have you had your breakfast? No, sir. I thought as much. Well, since you're now on my payroll, I'm obligated to feed you. Come on. That afternoon, the boys boarded a train for Montana. They found themselves liking and trusting their new employer. And by the time the train was climbing through the badlands of North Dakota, they had told him their story. So you've broken jail? Stolen a horse and sleigh and become fugitives, all because of getting drunk. Yes, sir. Oh, I say it's the fault of that deacon. He set too much store by his silver-mounted buggy whip and his buffalo robe. Yeah, so would I. Lads, I've seen a bit of the world, so listen to what I tell you. Now, first, I'm glad you told me the truth. And second, when we get to Montana, I want you to write to that deacon in Ohio, confess the truth to him. And third... I've never known a man to be any the better for the whiskey. And that's all I'll say. I'm not a preacher, but what I say is true. The boys stayed on with Scotty all through the spring and summer, and they learned their new trade very well. Late in the fall, they drove their steers to the railroad and loaded them into stock cars for the long trip east. Then, as winter set in, they found themselves with little to do. And it was then that Scotty came up with a plan. Lads, have you heard about the big stampede? Stampede? Aye, a gold rush. Where? A place called Loon Creek. First I've heard of Loon Creek. You'll hear of it from now on. It's about 200 miles from here. Gold, huh? They say the sand is heavy with it. And some have found good-sized nuggets. What you say, lads? Would you like to try your luck in the diggings? Well, we might strike it rich. <laughs> we might. Anyway, I'm going to try. And some of the lads are coming along. The, the two of you are welcome to join us. When the party reached Loon Creek, they found they were too late. Some 2,000 other prospectors were there ahead of them, and all the promising claims were taken. Provisions were scarce, and prices were sky high. Scotty and his men started the return trip, but Johnny and Cull elected to stay in the boom town for a while. Seems to me that with all this gold floating around, we ought to be able to get our hands on a little bit of it. I don't see how. Oh, I think maybe I do. And you're ahead of me. I've been practicing with these, and I'm getting pretty handy with them. You're going to play cards. Yep. Can they get me in a poker game? And if luck runs against you, then we'll be broke. Luck? I'll make my own luck. Come on, there's always a game over in the saloon. <laughs> when it comes to cards, looks like you could use a lesson or two from this kid, Bill. I've been getting one for the last two hours. <laughs> People are gonna stop calling you Lucky Bill. Reckon maybe your luck has changed hands, mister. I ain't so sure it is luck with you, kid. Meaning what? I ain't ever seen a card shark as young as you, but there's always a first time. Are you saying I've been cheating? I am. And there's only one thing to do with a puppy like you. No! Hey! hey, hey. hey. He drew first! He drew first! You all saw him! I shot in self-defense! Yeah, oh, he, he did! did. He, he did! did. Anyway, he ain't dead. He ain't even unconscious. Look! Oh, yeah. You won the hand, kid. That bullet in my shoulder makes your cards hard to beat. But I'm pretty well known around here, and I say you were cheating. We'll let the jury decide. But I say you tried to kill me when I caught on to your game. 
Justice was quick in those days. Johnny's trial took place the next morning in the saloon. The miners upheld Johnny's plea of self-defense, but also found him guilty of cheating. Johnny and Cole were given two hours to clear camp. Long before the time was up, they were well on their way, following the trail back to the ranch. Somewhere up ahead they knew were Scotty, Sourdough Tom, Joe, and the others in their party. Whoa! What are we stopping for? Something sticking up behind that rock. Looks to me like a man's boot. Yeah. Let's go down there and take a look. <gasps> Would you look at that? He's dead, ain't he? They don't come any deader. Why, it's Sourdough Tom. What do you suppose? Indians. How do you know? Hoof prints all around, no shoes on the horses. Indians must have caught Tom away from the rest of the party and killed him for his horse. Johnny, we would have been in that party. It could just as well have been you or me instead of Tom. Yeah. You know, we've been pretty lucky. You think it's luck? Well, it has to be. Look, I know we ain't religious, but maybe God is trying to get through to us. Uh, yeah. Well, why don't you say a, a prayer for old Tom? Me? Seems like the right thing to do. Yeah. Well, here goes. Uh, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy will be done. No. Uh, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in heaven and earth. Give us this day our daily bread and, and our daily bread. Oh, well, uh, God... This here is Sourdough Tom. Amen. Cole began to think hard about all the close calls. Near drowning back in Ohio, almost falling under the wheels of a moving train, Johnny's gunfight, and now this. He wondered how much longer he could ignore God and still remain alive. He knew he ought to give up drinking and wrong living, he even knew, from having heard the preaching in Chicago, that the Bible taught that the way to God was through Christ. But Cole wanted to work out his life even to reforming in his own way. To make good on his own, and then come to God with a clean slate. That's where he was terribly wrong, and he almost died while finding it out. Folks, we'll get back to Cole's story in just a moment. But first, I want to share a bit about how our ministry is able to bring hope to people all over the world. Unshackled is now in its 71st year of spreading the good news through powerful stories about real people. Our success is a result of God's blessing and the involvement of, well, supporters like you. When you contribute to Unshackled, it has a direct impact. Your support allows us to hire quality writers, talented actors, as you can hear, a skilled production team, and a devoted staff. Through your support, we're able to share Unshackled worldwide. So, in order to continue the work of spreading the gospel and allowing us to offer this program for free, won't you consider making a donation to Unshackled? It's really quite easy. All you need to do is click on the live link, if there's one where you're listening, or... Visit our podcast website at unshackledpodcast.org. That's unshackledpodcast.org. And then click the donate button. Or you can always write a check, unshackled. We take checks. You mail that check to 1458 South Canal Street, Chicago, Illinois, 60607. We thank you for your partnership in our ministry. Now... Back to the true story of Cole Wilcox, who thought he could remake his own character against all the inclinations of his nature. When a man tries to do right, he finds many compelling reasons to do wrong. It was so with Cole. A series of mishaps left Johnny and Cole in a small town with no food, no money, and, worst of all, no horses. There's plenty of horses in that corral over there, Cull. And saddles and bridles hanging on the fence. Are you crazy? 
They'll hang a horse thief in this town. If they don't shoot him first... We can't walk it. Come on, let's take a chance. Let's easy up, Johnny. We put a lot of miles between us and that corral. Yeah, I reckon you're right. We've been pushing these horses hard. It looks to me like we got some bad weather coming. I'd hate to be caught up here in a storm. I'd just hate to be caught. <laughs> By the people from that corral back there, not a chance. They're not within miles of here. Yeah? Then who just took a shot at us? They are following us. Come on, let's head for that brush. Johnny and Cole managed to escape, but only by abandoning their tired horses and crawling through the dense brush. Their pursuers, having caught the horses, concluded there was nothing to be gained by continuing the hunt and went back down the trail. Johnny and Cole were stranded in the mountains, on foot and empty-handed. That storm brewing turned menacing quick, and that was when the flash flood hit. Unable to swim, Cole grasped at anything within reach and found himself holding on to a small log. It kept him afloat until several miles downstream, where he was able to pull himself ashore. Freezing and sopping wet, he had no idea just how much his life had changed. I can't... I can't believe I made it. Johnny! 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 Where are you, man? Cole spent hours searching the banks of the now dwindling stream and at last became convinced that Johnny had been swept away. Then, as he explored further downstream, became certain. Less than half a mile from where Cole had fought his way to shore, the river fell more than a hundred feet into a narrow, rocky chasm, the sight of which brought Cole, at last, to his knees. He's gone, isn't he, God? There's no way someone could survive that fall. Maybe he wasn't even alive when he got that far. <laughs> All right, God. I admit it. I'm licked. God, forgive me. Johnny didn't know any better, but I did. I knew I was fighting you. So you've made your peace with God at last, lad? Yes, sir. After what happened, uh, I couldn't keep resisting. Aye. And what will you do now? Save every dime I can earn honestly. Pay off my debts and Johnny's debt to the deacon. And go back east to go to school. Well, I'd like to keep you here. Thanks, Scotty, but an uncle of mine in Helena wants me to come work for him. Well, then go. It's the first step in your way home. Oh, uh, Cole. I'm not what you'd call a religious man. But I believe that whatever you have, it's the real thing. Scotty gave Cull a gold nugget with a value of about five dollars. With that and a blanket roll, Cull started out for Helena, walking. Before long, he encountered a freight wagon pulled by a hitch of mules. How far are you figuring to ride with me, son? Hell enough, you're going that far. It's about where I'm headed. I got a nugget worth five dollars I can give you. That's so? It is, sir. I reckon it'll be fine. Good. That is, if you walk up the hills and help me with the mules and camp. I sure will. Well, this one, uh, Skinner, on the left, well, he requires a little more patience than what he's worth. I know the kind, sir, but don't worry. He's likely easier to get along with than some folks. <laughs> Bet my wife would agree. <laughs> Although Skinner proved to be a challenge, Cole didn't lose his temper with the mule. Rather than just seeing to himself, Cull actually cooperated and pitched in, like he said, helping set up camp, unhitch and hobble the mules, and chalk the wagon wheels. He even cooked. And all this went on for five days on the road to Helena. Only there, he wasn't quite certain what awaited him. Whoa! Whoa there! Whoa, 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 I said! 
Reckon you might as well get down here in town. I'm going ahead a ways before I stop. Thanks for the ride. Here's the nugget. No, mister. I can't do any better. That's all I got. I know, but you earned your ride without that nugget. Keep it, and if you don't find a place to stay, look me up on the edge of town, and I'll feed you, put you up for the night. Won't cost you nothing. Cole chuckled to himself and thanked God for that. Nothing like it had ever happened before. But Cole began to learn to depend on the help of God in everything. Once he stayed at a ranch with two German brothers who put him up and fed him like a prince. Somehow they got to craving cheese and acquired the notion that Cole knew how to make a cheese press. He didn't and was all set to run away at dawn, but once again, God proved faithful. An idea came to Cole as how to build the press. He tried it, and it worked. The Grateful Brothers fed him better than ever and gave him a cash gift to boot. There's a wonderful exhilaration about living close to God. Cole was really happy for the first time in his life and from that time on although circumstances brought pain as well as joy. Cole was a man who lived on top of his life situation, where before it had always pulled him down. Next week, we'll tell the rest of his story, and you'll see, in Cole's life, what it can mean to be, by faith, a child of God. Paul Wilcox found that eternal life begins from the moment a person receives Christ as their Savior. And that new life is clean and purposeful, rich with God's provision. This is what we mean when we say, your life, even though empty now, can be filled to overflowing. If you don't know about the living Lord who transformed Call. If that new life is not yet yours, feel free to get in touch with us here at Pacific Garden Mission, 1458 South Canal Street, Chicago, Illinois, 60607, or call 1-888-NEED-HIM. Now, we love hearing from our listeners here on the Unshackled Audio Drama Podcast, so send us your questions and we'll answer them here. It can be something you're curious about or just something you want to share with us. All you have to do is write us at podcast at unshackled.org or call and leave us a message at 312-281-1264. We'd love to hear from you. Now, before we get to our sweepstakes drawing info, I just want to remind you to subscribe or like our Unshackled Audio Drama Podcast. You can even share it or tell a friend. We'd also love for you to review or rate our podcast and don't forget to check out our other podcasts on this same platform, Unshackled Daily Devotionals and Unshackled in Person. We appreciate your input and involvement in our ministry. And again, please consider supporting us so we can freely offer quality Christian programming to the world. All right, the prize for this sweepstakes contest is another beautiful wooden scripture plaque. The verse on this one is Psalm 34, 1, which says, I will bless the Lord at all times. This is a gorgeous little thing, especially if you're looking for daily inspiration from Scripture. You will love this authentic wooden plaque. The plaque has been sawn from a tree branch or log and cut in such a way as to retain as much of the bark around the perimeter as possible. And this one's even got some <laughs> extra character, as it looks like a knot from the tree was sawn off with it. If you'd like a peek at this scripture plaque, you're welcome to visit our podcast website, unshackledpodcast.org, and stop by the audio drama page for a picture. And next time... Thank God, I'm alive. After a near-death experience, Carl Wilcox saw God's hand on his life, and it changed the way he viewed the world. Oh, God, thank you. Forgive me. Save me, Jesus. He sought to remake his character against the inclinations of his nature, but found it to be harder than he thought.
Can I help you, young fella? I'm your nephew, Cole, from back east. Well, Cole, if you need a job, I could use some help. That's what I was hoping for, Uncle Jerry. I was hoping you wouldn't ask me to sell liquor. In righting the wrongs from his past, would he come to see the true source of his empowerment? I know that ever since my conversion, I've been restless. I still think God has something for me to do. Don't miss the third and final part of this exciting true story of William Cullen Wilcox. Coming soon on Unshackled. Heard in part two of the true story of William Call Wilcox were Brian Plaharchik, Brad Armacost, Steve Bayorgian, and John Green. Original music, Don Badorf. Sound effects, Martin Robinson. Recording engineer, David Pierczynski. Audio engineer, Michael Kahn. Script, Joe Musser and Kylie Hammond. That's it for this week's Unshackled Audio Drama Podcast. So until next time, unless our Lord returns before then, I'm Timothy Gregory, your brother in Christ.